Right, um, thanks to both the speakers. I think now we'll just open it up to questions. I think when I went through the, uh, the registration list, I was intrigued by the, the, the different background of the people in the audience. When we run the water, the water seminars, most of the people in the audience are water engineers, so I have some uh, hope in understanding the question, but uh, the background of people here are power generation, dam people, and water, so um, we will open up for questions. Um, if you have a question, I'd like you to sort of start name and affiliation as well, and possibly which speaker you'd like to direct it to initially, although I'll, I'll let both speakers uh, answer questions as they see fit. So, first question, it's your turn to turn to this paper. Hey there, uh, Chris, sorry, I've got a question for Nick. How much uh, energy efficiency loss are you looking at when you're running a pumped hydro, and how would you see that competing in Tasmania where you've got traditional hydro? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so typically you might expect a, a cyclic efficiency on a pumped hydro project of around 75 to 80 percent. Um, that's pretty competitive with, with well, pretty similar to batteries. Um, um, for a, a traditional pumped hydro, uh, sorry, a traditional hydropower project, the losses might be um, in the order of, say, 85% or something like that. So the, the machines are very, uh, typically very efficient, even, even though they have to operate both pumping and generating. Um, so yeah, we, we would expect to see uh, 75 to 80% round trip efficiency, and that, that includes all the transmission losses as well. Awesome, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, stuck behind the pillar. <laughs> Can I come in? Yeah, please. Uh, Howard Witt, uh, Citizens Climate Lobby. Um, mostly for Andrew, I think. Um, you spoke that governments may be either blockers or supporters. Uh, how do you see the federal government stacking up with the new NEG? Uh, are they moving more towards being supportive? Um, I can answer the question as soon as I find out, find out what the NEG is. <laughs> it's um, the most intransparent hodgepodge mess I've, I've ever heard of. Well, it's probably some exaggeration, but compared with an elegant thing like um, a carbon price or a, um, an emission, uh, the, 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 there's dozens of policy instruments that could be used to achieve um, stability and uh, affordability and emission reduction, and they've chosen to leave possible. The, the least transparent, transparent and useful possible And it got off to a really bad start by some really awful modelling on um, what the current status is, which was just completely wrong. It, it just read like, um, tell us what the answer should be and we'll produce a modelling to prove it. Thank you for the talks. I, I really enjoyed both talks. It, it almost sounds like this is this is facetious, but it almost sounds like Malcolm Turnbull is listening to me, not to you, Andrew. Uh, the question is, uh, that I have is, do you believe that the engineering profession and the institution of engineers is doing enough to inform the government of what's actually possible? Is, it, is, is the problem, you know, is, is the profession doing enough to inform government? Uh, I don't and is the government not listening? Or yeah. is in fact there a, a, a knowledge gap here that an opportunity that the profession should be? Well, I've had several conversations with Malcolm Turnbull. He understands extremely well what the score is with renewables. And in one lengthy conversation, he, he said, is this statement right? Um, a lot of the people who are skeptical of uh, wind and PV are simply a few years behind the game and the prices are falling so fast that that's like last century. And of course I said yes, he understands and it's all politics. I'm sure there are lots and lots of very well qualified engineers and scientists and others who are giving him very, very good advice. There was a question off the back. And we'll come back to you. Yes, by the way. If you could stand up, the stand and tell me your affiliation, please. Any question? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And we don't have a microphone, unfortunately, so you need to speak um, up. Yeah. Well, I'll move out of here because I'm standing behind the pillar. Well, we're a question for Andrew. I mean, you painted a very optimistic picture about um, 70%, 100% renewables. Um, and you mentioned diversity. 
between wind and wind and soil. I'm just wondering whether you've done any modeling of this because with wind particularly, an email can't really allocate something like 8% diversity. Uh, if you take looking at weather patterns, if it's hot in Adelaide, it's hot in Melbourne. And when it's hot, the wind stops. So I'm just wondering whether, you've got two, two issues here, you've got diversity in wind, and you've got diversity in um, wind and solar combined, you've got weather patterns and so on. So that's one issue, but the other issue, the, the other leg to your, um, your uh, plan about getting 100% renewables is HBDC, and, and you certainly would need more transmission capacity to take advantage of what the diversity is once you establish one. I mean, no major transmission line has been built in the last two decades. It takes seven to ten years to build one major line. That's the lead time to build a major transmission line. The ones you're wondering whether you factor that in as well. Uh, in answer to your first question, the modelling we're doing um, <coughs> takes hour by hour data for demand and wind and solar in um, uh, 43 different cells along the entire eastern seaboard. And so it takes account of the um, uh, wind time series uh, from in everywhere from Townsville down to Tasmania and everywhere in between. And the model puts in uh, more and more wind and PV and storage and interconnection until the demand is always met and then works out what the overall cost is. It's a genetic algorithm, so you just run it and run it and run it, and eventually you, you end up with a, a solution space which is very broad, so it, it, in the sense that um, putting more storage and less interconnection costs much the same as uh, putting more PV wind and spilling a bit more. It all uh, works out about you know, $25 a megawatt hour plus or minus a few. <coughs> Um, and the important thing about that, that, that number is it's not a scary number. In terms of time frames, um, we don't actually need uh, strong interconnection for another 10 years, but I don't think it will take anything like 10 years to put in an HVD system. Um, it, an overhead HVD system or an underground HVD system, is, it, it really is off the shelf. And these things are going in at substantial rates all around the world. It's not esoteric technology. If we decide to do it, we can just do it. Um, to, uh, pump hydro, ditto, the traditional view of pump hydro is eight or ten years. Uh, well, Kidston um, will be three years from um, getting the bulldozer to start its engine to finishing. Um, and uh, there are, uh, one of the important things is that um, pump hydro in the future is likely to be off river. So you're not down in a river valley with bespoke engineering um, worrying about a thousand, one in a thousand year flood coming just as you've got the dam half built. You're completely away from rivers and that avoids a lot of the complications. So in short, I think um, all the time frames are just fine. The rate limiting step is not the pump hydro, it's not the high voltage new connectors, it's simply getting the PVM wind built. Uh, back on the side. Uh, <coughs> I'm not from the from the UNSW Water Research Laboratory. I've got a two-part question. The first is for Nick. You mentioned in the uh, Kingston project the water quality problem, and usually in mine board it's uh, very saline water. Uh, how is it solved or addressed in uh, the design that you're working on? And I guess if we're talking, if this is the case and it's saline water, this is a, the question is for both of you. What is your view and potential for um, seawater pump storage given and very close to the coast and just constant transmission. Just answering yes, the first question. Um, the, the contaminant at um, Kidston is a it's a heavy metal of some sort. It's not actually the, the, the salinity is not that high. It could be it could be discharged to the environment if, if it was just based on the salinity, but at some other exotic element that um, that is causing the problem there. Um, as for saltwater pumped hydro, there's a um, a project in Japan that has recently, it, well, it, it operated for 15 years before the market that it was operating in changed completely um, and has recently shut down. But that, that project, uh, it, it was a demonstration project built by the Japanese uh, and it operated very successfully with very few problems for, for a long time. Um, 
is a proponent of a pump storage uh, scheme in South Australia, with, which is, uses um, seawater. Um, obviously, these have these sorts of projects have more stringent environmental um, safeguards in place, um, but there's no reason why why seawater can't be used. Um, there, there's plenty of sites around around Australia and around the world for these pumps. Um, that said, uh, we found 22,000 sites, good sites, and not a single one was near the sea, because there is no place in the whole of Australia where high hills meet the sea outside of the National Park. If you want to make do with a 200 metre head, then you might find a few places that work. But when there's 500, 600, 700 metre heads around, and in the, in the thousand quantities, why would you add in complication to the seawater and coastal engineering with all the Opposition that you'll find. Question. We'll have the back of this slide. Now, Dennis Cook, uh, uh, electrical power and near mine consultancy business. I have one question for Andrew, just in the context of uh, what you said a few minutes ago about uh, modelling the wind and solar across the country on an hourly basis across all these locations. What makes you think that an hour is so sufficient because the grid has to be balanced every split second, every millisecond, every cycle? And indeed, there are many times on the NEM right now when there is, the solar and wind contribution to the NEM is zero. Um, the, the reason why hourly is pretty much sufficient is that pump hydro has all of the inertia uh, advantages that um, a coal or a gas power station has got. Um, it's got uh, rotational inertia, it's got uh, very rapid response, you can go from zero to flat out in a couple of minutes, uh, much faster than gas or coal. It, it, um, you can do a black start, it really is the gold standard and you're going to have um, 20 or 30 gigawatts of pump hydro in a 100% uh, renewable system or you might have a bit less in a lot of, a lot of batteries. And, um, when, when you look closely, uh, you, you tend to actually end up with a more stable system, not a less stable system. The reason is that you have entirely removed one of the major um, fault causes in your system. At the moment, um, the failure of a boiler in a coal fire power station can easily take out 500 megawatts, and it does regularly. I think there are 42 um, fault conditions, of major fault conditions in the um, Australian coal fleet so far this summer. Um, in a PV wind system, losing a wind turbine or losing a solar, a solar panel makes one in a million difference. You can't even see it. So you have almost entirely removed the penalty of um, an unexpected failure. You're still stuck with the transmission failure mode but so is the existing system. So, uh, and the, the, the weather systems, when you scatter the PV and wind over large areas, change very slowly. It takes days for weather to go from east, from west to east. Um, so you have plenty of warning. So in short, I think that um, the renewable energy system of the future will be more, not less reliable. Question down, question down the front, front row. Yeah, uh, Reece Hubbard Jones from WMA Water downstairs. I don't know anything about energy. Um, I've got a couple of questions for you, Andrew, just about where do you see the majority of, of PV and wind being generated in, in terms of the breakdown between, you know, on, on houses, photovoltaics on houses versus large farms regionally? And then how well does our existing urban infrastructure, the, the grid, cope with that? Is there, are there major capital upgrades that need to be done to the grid itself? or? or how, how big are those challenges in the process? That's done, or are they quite easy? Um, I think that um, virtually all, uh, well, most buildings that have a sunny aspect are going to have um, 5, 10, 15, 100, 500 kilowatts on their roof. And something like a quarter of all of the PV and wind will be on roofs, or maybe even a third. Um, and I think that every country town will get a PV system sitting next to its substation with a capacity equal to that substation every existing power line will be saturated with PV and wind up to the full capacity of that power line. If they can find a pump hydro site, then they can go way over the capacity of that power line because they can store the power temporarily and then squeeze it down in the middle of the night through this constrained power line. Um, 
I think there are significant opportunities for unexpected places. For example, Alice Springs has um, wonderful wind and wonderful solar and wonderful pump hydro. And it's only 2,000 kilometres from Sydney and in fact is a fantastic renewable energy zone because the weather is totally different from the southeast. So it's going to be all of the above, everywhere. And the rise and rise of low cost HVDC just opens and opens opportunities. For example, to interconnect to um, other countries as well. Down the back. Yeah, Frank Mavis, the civil engineer. Just an easy, a quick one. I think I may have missed something. With that heavy metal water that you couldn't treat, uh, Kidston, wasn't it? Yeah. What did you do? With it? Did you pump it back up, or did you leave it in a, the lower reservoir? I, I, yes. Yeah. So that um, that's a challenge that still has to be. Oh, okay. But, but okay. what they will do is is build the upper reservoir and then pump all the water into the upper reservoir um, while they do the construction in the lower reservoir. So um, yes, they'll be storing it on site in in the upper reservoir. So will it stay on site, or will you treat it later? No, no, it'll it'll stay on site. So it's a heavy metal water that'll stay there. It doesn't get sent back through. Um, well, it'll, it'll be used in the generation. And is it pumped back up though? Yes. Okay. Okay. Right down to the front. Yeah, uh, Fred Thompson, mechanical, mostly retired. <laughs> question, question to uh, Nick. Given that the technology is, is pretty mature, why are the development costs so high in the pump hydro schemes? Um, a lot of it's to do with the fact that all of these power stations are underground, so the geotechnical risk is substantial. Um, so there could be a, a multi-million dollar um, geotechnical investigation program that, that, that has to go on before you can get a decent price out of your civil works contractor. The E&M supply will give you a budget price on a one-page step to within 10% of the, of the cost that they will deliver it for. So it's not it's not the E&M that carries the risk in the development, it's the, it's the civil works. And, and the, the legal fees and the financing fees and, and um, all of the other bits that have to go into developing a project of hundreds mm -hmm. of millions of dollars. That's right. Yeah. So indeed, the uh, charge uh, four miles for the hydro for 20 years. Uh, I just had uh, one question about your costing of $3 million in my own elsewhere and $2 million or even less to $1 million for spending. Why is that? Um, the, I think it really comes down to the fact that many of the good project sites around the rest of the world have been developed. So in the past, you might have found that, that um, the projects elsewhere have been built for, for low costs, less than $2 million a megawatt. Um, in Australia, we haven't built any of those projects yet. And um, it really turns out that the cost of a turkey nest dam is relatively cheap in comparison to a, a, um, a traditional on-stream dam of the same capacity. So um, the, the capital costs, are, or the opportunity to save on the capital costs in Australia. Oh, right, down the back again. Um, so, uh, Nick Batt from uh, Equal Energy Storage. Um, I was just wondering how those costs translate to cost per megawatt hour. Um, that's a very good question. <laughs> um, the difficulty is to put a, well, in putting a price on the megawatt hours is that utilisation has to come into it. So um, it's very difficult to predict how much a project will be utilised um, without knowing what the market is going to do. So, um, and, and looking at, at current examples, um, uh, the Wyman Ho and Shoalhaven and, and Chimit 3, for example, doesn't provide any guidance on how much it will be utilised. Those, those projects are part of large portfolios and they only operate when, when it suits the, the owners of the project. So, um, there's figures from the US that suggest the cost per megawatt hour could be around $200 a megawatt hour. Um, I think that it's probably more like $120 to $150 a megawatt hour in Australia. Um, another way of approaching that question is to look at what the total system cost is. The cost of generation plus the cost of balancing. And um, according to the calculations we've done, the upper bound price on the on the storage component balancing is only $12 per megawatt hour of actual megawatt hours sold into the system. 
that's taking, that's not an individual project number, that's a whole system number. So $12 pays, um, $75 all up uh, pays $70 to $100, which is the current wholesale market price of electricity. So I was, I was actually referring to the capacity cost. So for, uh, for example, the Kidston project is a 2,000 megawatt hour um, pro project. Um, and so for that total capacity, what sort of... So, um, the public, publicly available costs for that is around $330 million for that project. Um, but but the, yeah, the capital costs for the, well, in terms of megawatt hours is really dependent on the site. Um, it depends on the head and the amount of storage that you can actually achieve. Um, so it's, yeah, it's not, not very easy to say that it, it's a, a cost per megawatt hour um, of energy and storage, you really need to look at the at how it operates to be able to quantify that. And, and one important point is it can't be compared with the prices that um, battery people quote. Uh, if you've got a thing, a thing that will last 50 to 100 years, uh, it, uh, it, you can't compare that with battery which might last eight years. Right down the back row, yeah. I'm standing for a second question. I'm moved so I can see you. Right? That's the way I can perceive you. How it works, this is Simon Lee again. Look, I think that perhaps some of the reason we're having a political delay is because of the royalties we get from coal. Uh, so this question is blue sky thinking, and you did allude to this in creating kerosene for aeroplanes. Um, there are there opportunities, we've got all this power from solar and wind and solar, are there opportunities to replace export royalties from coal and natural gas with royalties from other fuel created from electricity? Uh, the question of whether Australia can utilise its wonderful wind and PV to make a lot of money to replace coal and gas. Coal and gas currently generates about 50 or 60 billion a year in sales and I don't know what that translates to at all. Um, the short answer is yes and no. Um, in terms of exporting hydrogen or jet fuel or anything like that, I think we have really rather poor prospects. The reason for that is that we're stuck out in the um, South Pacific Ocean, a long way from the centres of use. Um, the fact is that Asia has enormous PV and wind opportunities and can be connected with overland uh, high voltage DC from London to Vladivostok and everywhere in between, which means that um, there will be 24 hour PV and wind power available uh, delivered directly to your door so that you can make your own hydrogen if you want to make jet fuel uh, with an electrolyzer in your own backyard. You're not going to want to import hydrogen from Australia, that's ridiculous. There is, however, one enormous opportunity in Australia, uh, and that is Australia is the world's largest exporter of iron oxide. And uh, if we export iron by uh, converting using um, PV wind to reduce the iron oxide to iron, then the um, approximate value of the energy required to do that is about 50 or 60 billion. It happens to be about the same as the exports of coal and gas at present. And there, uh, the, we have an enormous advantage because of the co-location of excellent wind, excellent sun, excellent pump hydro, and the world's biggest export iron reserves all in the Pilbara. And the fact is that iron is 20 times larger than the next largest um, mineral export. So it's all about iron with aluminium and chromium and all the rest of the people's on the bum. So the possibility of a really large scale iron export industry instead of iron oxide driven by PV wind in the Pilbara, it's real. And it's about the same size as the coal gas industry. Go ahead. Yes, you. One more. Yeah, one, one more question, if I may. And mostly to, to Andrew. I see the sequence of investment being a major problem in all of this. In other words, you need a transmission line before any, anyone's going to invest in the in, in the wind or PV, we this not is this not the case? And in general, investment in any of those projects is is, is going to be the major driving or blocking influence. Uh, no, I don't agree at all. Um, PV and can go on your roof, uh, and then PV and wind will dock around every 
transmission line and substation in the whole of Australia. And then only um, when you get to the point where uh, you, you eventually come to some point where you say, okay, there's a really fantastic resource out in Alice Springs or up in Townsville. Let's bite the bullet and put in a five gigawatt uh, HVDC line up to those two places. And then um, you'll find that the private sector will very rapidly build out the full capacity of that line with high uh, PV and wind. Yes, I can see that, but who is going to invest in the DC transmission line in the, in the first instance? Well, I think uh, talk about Kinston, because you want to discuss me, they're putting 50 kilo, uh, megawatts of PV on, on an existing car line first. Um, yes, so the, the, well, we had someone at the conference today talk out from Transcript, <coughs> assured the, the room that was full of developers that if they build a pumped hydro, they would have the transmission line there ready for them to, be, to use when the, when the time came. Um, transmission is, it, it, needs, it needs to go through its own approvals process and, and that sort of thing. So there is definitely a lead time in, in delivering a transmission line. Um, but the, the, I suppose the, the long lead time for, for pumped hydro allows that, allows that to occur. So, um, yeah. I, I believe that, the, that even if it is a government entity that has to build this build a transmission line, um, they, assuming that the, the, the government's supportive of, of the project, then, then there will be impetus to, to build the transmission line and develop, deliver it in time for the work on the line. But having said that, it's not, un, not uncommon around the world to have a project sitting waiting for a transmission line to turn up. So, yes, there, that is a risk. We have time for another couple of questions or maybe draw it to a close. Just wait for a second. Yes, just behind the pillar. Yeah. Uh, uh, Tom Gillespie from GHD. Um, if, if there is an increase in, in HVDC emission line, um, such that we do have you know, some solar in PV and um, pump storage in our spring, the potential that MT and WA would join the NEM. Um, once you get to Alice Springs, it's very tempting to run on to the Perth district and also the northwest to pick up the Bilbra, indeed. There you go. Right down the back row, my left hand side. Um, James Young, um, the power grid is run to the very close control of frequency, and we're talking just cycles per second. And that frequency control is used to balance the demand and the supply. If you don't have accurate and sustainable frequency control on the system, then you don't get the control and know when to call up more generation or whatever else you have to do. One of the problems that happens with wind and solar is that there is no inertia in the system and it's extremely difficult to control frequency and there is no uh, satisfactory way of controlling frequency at the moment with wind and solar, although there's experiments doing it, have, uh, trying to do it, but it's not successful at this moment. And the second thing is the ability to ride through intermittent pulse and heavy rotating machinery can ride through. South Australia, the big blackout on the 28th of September of 16, was it? All of the wind farms dropped off the circuit in two seconds from the first fall on the line. And that fall had nothing to do with the tornadoes that happened later. The blackouts uh, happened with a spike on the line. The wind farms didn't ride through and there was a total blackout. And I can't see any way that a 100% or any other large percentage of intermittent wind can in fact run the power grid because we can't control frequency. Is it, is it a question or a comment? Oh, it's a comment. Well, I can ask the question, <laughs> how do you control frequency in an intermittent system like wind and uh, solar? Uh, I, I just don't, I disagree with almost everything you said. Um, in fact, um, Pump hydro, of course, is heavy rotating machinery, just like a coal-fired power station. Secondly, um, 
uh, PV and wind inverters uh, can, in, um, uh, with, uh, can in fact um, con uh, contribute substantially to frequency control. For example, you, you can back off a wind and PV farm by 10 or 20% if it looks like there's a stress period coming up. So you've got both upside and downside control, and that happens in uh, milliseconds. Um, with modern electronics, it's really not an issue. Um, the cause of the South Australian blackout was, of course, a tornado bringing down 20 odd power, power, power pylons. Uh, so the second cause was the fact that AUMO had the interconnector running blackout instead of backing off. They didn't, didn't look at the weather forecast. And the third was that there was um, some standby generators that failed to start. And the fourth was that there were some incorrect settings on the wind uh, inverters, which meant that they didn't ride through, which have been fixed. So I think that there is no technical obstacle to get to 100% PV wind, in particular if you've got lots of heavy rotating hydro in the system. I think on that note, we might. Um, <laughs> um, I'd like to, well, I'd like you all to have join with me in thanking Andrew and Nick for what's been a very, from yeah. my point of view, a very enlightening uh, discussion on pumped hydro. Look, I think from what I've heard, we're on the cusp of something dramatic happening in the PV, the, the wind and the, the pumped hydro. And if I can find any barrier, it seems to me at the moment the barrier, the greatest barrier we're facing is a political barrier. And just uh, get the politicians, whoever it might be, to make a decision to take a holistic approach to what needs to be done, not just in New South Wales or Queensland or South Australia, but around the country and looking at all of the upside that we can bring to this as well. So once again, thank you very much for helping me better understand what some hydro is and how it fits in and, and where we are going from here. And I think it's an optimistic future. For the first time I've heard that there could be something that helps us deal with the greenhouse gas emissions and climate change. So thank you very much.